Morning, guys. This is Scott Fresner with TBiz Network. I'd like to thank you for joining my webinar. This is going to be a training webinar on TCEPS 3, and that's our newest, uh, latest, greatest program. I'm going to assume that you really don't know much about TCEPS. I know a lot of you probably have TCEPS 2.0, and you're going to watch this webinar to catch some of the new features of TCEPS 3.0. And if you don't know much about TCEPS 3.0, I encourage you to watch the video on the webinar we did Friday that was the introduction to TCEPS 3.0. So catch that. It's online now. It's on YouTube. It's about 45 minutes in length, and uh, that'll show you the basics of TCEPS 3.0. Uh, I'm in Photoshop CS6 right now, and TCEPS 3.0 only works in CS6 and CC, and the reason for that is that there's some new features in CS6, and Adobe made some changes on the developers level where I can actually do uh, a lot more graphical things in CS6 and C CC that I couldn't do in CS5 or earlier. So TCEPS is the latest, uh, greatest generation of TCEPS 2.0 and it's a, got a graphical interface. Let's talk quickly about how we install TCEPS. The issue I get a lot is people will sometimes send me an email and they'll, uh, they'll say they're having a problem and my response will sometimes often be, uh, did you read the manual? The response is typically, you know what the response is. No, I haven't looked at the manual. And people are looking for an icon on their desktop. They're looking for uh, the program to be uh, an executable program. TCEPS is a plugin for Photoshop. When you install TCEPS, if you're a PC user on either the CD or the download, you've got a file called TCEPS 3.0 installer.exe. And by the way, I'm doing this webinar on a PC right now, so I'm on a, I can't show you the Mac installation. But and I'm within Photoshop, so I'm just showing you what the file looks like. If you double click on this file outside of Photoshop, either from a download, and it may be a zip file if you downloaded it, because there's also a quick start instruction sheet with the download. So if you download the file, you've got a little direction sheet with it, but once you unzip that file, you've got a file called TCEPS 3.0 installer exe. If you double click on this, it's a real standard Windows installer and it'll uh, just go through the paces and it'll install all the files in the correct location. If you're a Mac user, it's a installer package and it's also zipped up and it's got a quick start readme so if you downloaded it, you get a file that looks like this. It may have a similar name depending on the download and when you then double click on it, it's going to unzip the file. It's going to be a regular Mac installer package and it's going to just go through its paces and it's going to install everything in the right location. Now when it's done installing, it'll make on your computer a folder called TCEPS3. Notice that this is actually in a subfolder called TCEPS 3.0 webinar files. This is not where the program puts it. I'm just showing you what it looks like. And basically, this folder ends up on the C drive on a PC or in the applications folder on a Mac. And it has all the key files. It has actually the distressed overlay. So when you run the distressed routine, it will ask you where the distressed overlays are. They're in this folder. It has the various actions and the various plugins and has backups of them. So you can have them either on a CD or in this folder. It has the ink properties for the CMYK inks for some of the ink companies. It has the graphics for the job proof routine, which are the little t-shirt graphics, because when you run the job proof routine, it will ask you where is the shirt graphic. And by the way, these are standard PNG files, and when you run the job proof routine, you can actually uh, use your own files. You can create your own little t-shirt graphics. They can be more freeform, more realistic looking, as long as they have a transparent background and they're PNG. Uh, but we've given you just two basic ones to use for the job proof module. There's also the manual. And again, I encourage you to read the manual. It has a great section on installation. It goes through the step-by-steps of how to unlock the program. And you'll save yourself a lot of time and a lot of pain and strain if you read the manual because most of my support emails are from people that are getting errors, and the errors are because the file wasn't prepared correctly. It either had layers going on or it was CMYK, and they kind of missed the real important points of running routines in TCEP. So I want you to crack open the manual. It's actually not too bad. We'll just bring it up here. It's 77, uh, no, it's 85 pages now. I updated it. And it's got lots of little pictures, lots of stuff going on. Uh, it's Don't be overwhelmed by the size of it. Just breeze through it real quick, especially the getting started, the quick start section. Uh, it kind of tells you about how to use the program. It has a, a section if you're in a hurry. If you're a power user, it has a section for you that says, okay, you know what you're doing. Maybe you know TCEPS 1.0 or 2.0. Here's how to get going really quickly with TCEPS 3.0. So I encourage you to crack the manual open and take a look at it. Now, 
the TSEPS 3 folder also has a folder called samples and there's a few pre-done samples if you're brand new to this kind of program and don't know what a layers file looks like I've given you some test samples right here and there's also a folder called team viewer team viewer is an online viewing program that uh, it's for, for Mac or PC so on the Mac version yours will look slightly different than this but when you click on this it'll actually open a program called Team Viewer where I can log onto your computer once you give me the password and we can do an online session and this is built into the program right here. TSLEPS loves to do stuff like this if its strength is this kind of separation and the file could start off as a Corel file this file started off, I'm, I'm sure, as an AI or Corel file. I got it from a customer, but somewhere it started off as a file like that. It can be a file that was built in Adobe Illustrator, like this Harley file. It can be a file like this Classy Cars built in Photoshop. It can be a file built in a variety of programs. This webinar will be a quick training webinar. We try and keep it to less than an hour. And so we aren't going to cover every little nut and bolt of TSEPs because the truth is you're going to use some of the program all the time. I do separations every day and I use a couple of routines for most of my stuff. TSEPS works on Mac or PC. Now, once you install the program, you're kind of home free, but not quite. I'm going to close the TSEPS panel out. TSEPS works in the panels section of Photoshop. Once you open, once you install TSEPS and you open Photoshop, you're going to get a little window that says try or authorize. If you click on try, you can use the program for 20 days until you get the unlock. If you click on Authorize, it generates a request code for your computer. I can't tell you how many requests we get from people that say, send me the unlock, and then we have to go back and email you and say, the unlock starts with you. You've got to generate a request code for your computer. So please, uh, when you see the word Authorize, click on it. It gives you a number, send that number in, and then we send that back based on that computer. And by the way, you can put TSEPs on two computers, Mac or PC. But it works in the uh, panel section. So once you open Photoshop and get past the Try Authorize window, you click on Window, come down to Extensions. This is called a panel extension. And you'll see TSEPs right there. Now, if you're a current user of TSEPs 1.0, 2.0, or fast films, you know that the program worked in the Actions panel. TSEPs 3.0 does not work in the Actions panel. It works in its own panel called an Extension panel. If you're a current user of TSEPs, you know that if you go to the File, pull down menu and come down to automate you normally would see the plugins here the plugins no longer reside here they're actually here but they're hidden as a security measure so there will be some things that will throw you off if you're a current user of the program you will no longer find the plugins under the automate menu and you will not be working out of the actions panel by the way TSEPS 3.0 separation suite loads the an action in the actions panel but you don't work from it so you may see your actions panel actually be loaded with a a new action but we work from this panel right here. Now this panel is a typical panel in that we can dock it. Now typically I uh, like my computer laid out a certain way. This is called the preferences in Photoshop, how we like our panels. Each of you have your own preferences. I like to have the channels panel available. I like to have the layers panel available. I like to have history available. I don't need a lot of the rest. And some of you have a lot of panels going on, and I know that you don't use them that often. Just get, get rid of some of those. Close them out. Now I'm in TSEPs, of course, uh, Photoshop CS6 and CSCC and for those of you that are the power users you know that you can change the interface I happen to not like the real dark interface I find it a little too dark and so I'm going to be working in a little lighter interface but this is the new Photoshop interface I kind of call it the gamer photographer interface I happen to be used to Photoshop the way it looks in all the previous versions okay you've got two steps loaded the panel should look like this you can uh, sh you shorten lengthen you can do this a typical panel you can move it around you can uh, minimize it to give you more screen space so it's just a very typical panel now there's a couple things you have to do still before we're done uh, getting set up Photoshop is set up now out of the box to allow all the files to open as what's called a tab and that means if you open multiple files, there's tabs, and the files are all kind of in one container. I tend to like to turn that off, but we have to leave that turned on to run TSEPs. And this is under the interface, and it's called Open Documents as Tabs. I typically like to keep this turned off uh, prior to CS6, but, but in CS6 there's a bug. And the bug is that Photoshop will not find a previous file, meaning if I have more than one file open, uh, 
and I and I'm looking to look to the previous file as TCEPs often does. It can't find it unless it's opened as a, as a tab. They call it open documents as tabs. So that has to be checked. So make sure that's checked. If you've got CS6 running and you don't like opening documents as tabs, you have to go back and recheck that now. Now the the last thing to do is we have to go to color settings. And in the old days, I would have you make some of these settings automatically, and these settings adjust how the channels display. We want to display the channels with dot gain applied. We want to make sure and tell it that if we're going to do a CMYK separation, we tell it what the settings are, and we would in the old days tell you how to do this. Today, uh, with TCEPs 3.0, you get a settings folder. And the file is called TCEPs Color Settings. If you load this, it does all this for you automatically. And so once you've done this, by the way, you don't have to come back here. Now, Color Settings is a menu in Photoshop, and Photoshop writes all these changes to its own preferences file. You all know that if you open Photoshop, every now and then Photoshop will open up with all your panels in the default location. Everything's been changed back. It means Photoshop lost the settings for the preferences. And if that happens, you've got to go back and reload it. You'll know if it lost the settings if you go to Edit, Color Settings, and you don't see it say TCEPs Color Settings here. You'll know that Photoshop uh, lost or trashed the preference file. And it just, it just makes a new one based on its default, so you've got to reload those settings. So now we're set up. We've got the panel open. We've got the Color Settings set. We have the Open Document as Tabs set. Uh, we've got the Manual cracked open. Again, this is the kind of stuff that TCEPs likes. Let's talk first about the artwork preparation. We open up a couple files here. You all know what that means, artwork to fix. Here's the problem. You're going to be getting in low quality artwork. I do separations all day long and it's just I just get stuff in that's, you know, I I have good customers who send me good high res stuff. They build an AI. We're going to talk about how to build stuff in AI in Corel and keep it nice and sharp. But typically what you get in is stuff that was at the time maybe a nice high res file, but now it's a low quality JPEG. You know, somewhere along the line, somebody saved this file too many times as a low quality JPEG, and you get this kind of stuff. And the problem is TCEPs working with an RGB file will often take the green, combine it with the blue, uh, do a mask around it, and you can see if you look at the RGB by itself, you can see it's junk. This stuff is to get worse when you separate it. Sometimes you run a set of separations and go, where did that come from? And if you reopen the file and look at just the red, the green, or the blue channel by themselves, you see this stuff. You don't see it quite so bad when the RGB is on as a composite. But when you're looking at the individual channels, you see this. This is called, I call this the boxes. This is from JPEG files averaging things out. When you make a low quality JPEG, it kind of says, okay, I'll take this group right here, this section, and I'll just average it out. And so a JPEG file is uh, really junky. Now, TCEPs has a nice routine under optional routines, improve image quality, and one is called improve low quality JPEG. Now, watch what happens here. This routine is going to, of course, prompt you and tell you what's going to happen, and it works on a file that is open. It's going to cook, do some gobbledygook. Now, you'll notice the file is a hair softer, but it's definitely uh, cleaner now. We have all the little artifacts, we call them, removed. And so now the file is much, much better. Well, it's going to separate much better. I'd rather have the file a, a hair softer than have all those boxes. So you want to always take, take a look at the original artwork. Here are the key points to the original artwork. The artwork needs to be at the final image size. Again, I get files all day long that are always, I, I just can't believe, they're always 72 DPI and they're uh, low physical size. You always go to image, image size and you check the file size and the resolution. Uh, this is the right physical size, I'm guessing. It's 13 inches wide. And you would typically upsample the file. And upsample simply means make it the right resolution. And I want to be typically working at 300 DPI at the final size. Now, sometimes Photoshop will play with your, with your mind a little bit. It will actually switch to centimeters. And then you get spooked. And you made this file 12 centimeters by 300 DPI. You've got to make sure it always says inches if you're thinking in inches. If you're thinking in centimeters, then typically a 12-inch file will be about 30 centimeters. So you always upsample the file. Now, upsampling means the file may get softer because you're taking a file that was not real sharp to begin with. And, but you need to get it the right physical size. 
especially if you plan on adding more text to this file. If you plan on doing more graphic elements with this file and doing more in building it, uh, if you build it at low res and then upsample it, all the things you added to it, including type, are now low res. You want to build it, uh, uh, bring the file up, upsample it to 300 dpi at the final physical size. And I like to have rulers on, by the way. And if you go to View, one of your checkboxes is Rulers. If you're new to Photoshop, by the way, there's, a, there's some really good training videos online at the TSEPS training video section on Photoshop. In fact, there's over 25 videos. Most of them are done in TSEPS 2.0, but the basic tweaking of the files and running of the routines after you've pushed the button uh, works the same in 2.0 and 3.0. 3.0 just is running better with different routines. I like to keep rulers on so I can kind of see what's going on here, see what the file is. So you must know what it is. You must know what the image size res resolution is. I Again, I get files all the time, and I will send people back, and I'll say, this file is only 72 dpi, and the response typically is, oh, I didn't know that. Also, people will send me files and say, will this work for separating? And uh, sometimes I'll uh, zoom in real close, and I'll make sure they, they know that this file is not sharp. And I'll always email back, uh, did you use the Zoom tool? If you ever took any of, my, any of my seminars in the past, you'll know that I use that quite often. It's a kind of a said a little tongue in cheek. Did you zoom in on it? And typically people don't. They look at the file like this and go, wow, that looks great. But you've got to zoom in because there's no magic. TSEPS sees what it sees. In fact, the problem is TSEPS does not see a hard black edge here. It sees gray levels, and it sees a darker blue and a lighter blue, and it's going to give you separation for that. You're going to get these halos around your images because a separation program separates what it sees. Now, you, a lot of you are going to be working in AR Corel and uh, building images there. And of course, if it's just basic spot color, you don't need TSEPs, although TSEPs works well with spot color. But you're going to build an image with lots of gradations and shading, and maybe you place a photograph in it or a other image. When you bring the image into Photoshop, Photoshop will obviously open up a native AI, Adobe Illustrator file. It will open up a PDF. It'll open up a PSD, a TIFF, a JPEG. But you know if it's a TIFF or a JPEG or a PSD, it's a pixel-based file. Uh, you know that if it's an EPS or an AI, it is probably a vector file. And so let's do this. I'm going to open up this PDF file. And this is very important. If you open a PDF, you get this window. And it's set default to a resolution of 72 dpi with anti-aliasing turned on. And this is real important. If with anti-aliasing turned on, Photoshop says, I want to soften these edges. I'm not going to give you the exact resolution of the file. I'm going to try and soften the edges so it's going to print really cool to an inkjet printer. And we don't want it to do that. And if you blow by this window, here's what you get. I'm going to say OK. Brings the file up. I'm going to zoom in on it. That's what we got. Not only do we have a jagged edge, by the way, these checks in the background mean it's a transparent background. That's what you want. When you bring in a file from a vector program, you want no background. You don't want the shirt color to be part of it, by the way. I get files all the time that are built in AI or Corel, and the shirt color is there, or maybe there's even a little shirt graphic. That's cool to show the customer, but you don't need that to separate. The shirt color uh, has, you don't separate that color. I sometimes say it has nothing to do with the separations. It, it does in that it'll, it'll help you to know how much to boost an underbase and how much to block the shirt from showing through. But in actually pulling colors, the shirt has nothing to do with it. But look at this. This was, a, this was a vector file. We just screwed this file up. And this is the kind of stuff I get where I know the file was vector at one time. And I know that somebody opened it and thought, well, I'll send Scott the JPEG. He can use a JPEG. And I get that kind of a file. Let me close this file out. Let's do this one more time. File, open. I'm going to turn off anti-aliasing, and because this is a vector file, and I know some of you are my vector snobs, and don't take that the wrong way, but it means that you really hate to see pixels, and you really want to try and emulate higher resolution, you know, with faster computers, look, at this file is only going to be 4.97 megabytes. I could make this thing 600 DPI, and it's going to be not a very big file. Uh, and let's see what this file is in size, inches. Let's make this thing a little bigger. So it's 41 megabytes, not a big deal. I've turned off anti-aliasing. I've turned the resolution to a pretty high resolution. Now we zoom in. That's what we're talking about. That's what we want to separate from. Notice there's no soft edges. There's jaggies, yes, but we're zoomed way in on it. And these are going to go away when we put this on screen mesh, convert the halftone dots, print it on that shirt. But there's no little softening, which is the anti-aliasing, because anti-aliasing is going to give you that little lighter color that TSEPS is going to see. It's going to separate that second color. We want to see the colors nice and clean. So it's very important when working in AI or Corel 
to either save as a PDF or if you're an AI, just save it as an AI, turn off the shirt color. If you're in Corel, you can export as a PDF or export as an EPS. And when, again, when you open these files up, you get that window and you can't blow by that window. Now, one of the confusing things about using a program like TCEPS is how to prepare the artwork to separate. And the confusing thing is, I'll just bring up uh, files I use way too often, but I'll bring them up because they tell the story. By the way, see how they open up the tabs? I hate that because now we can't really kind of see we have two files open. I will undock them. You can always undock them. It says it has to be set to open as a tab uh, for Photoshop to run correctly with TCEPs. Somehow, some way, you need two versions of the art. Now, I know some other programs use just a transparent background, but that's deceiving. This is a pretty clean file here, but if this file had a vignetted edge, a very soft edge, uh, then, then it would be harder to create what I call the masked version. Think of it this way. If this is the only file you got from the customer, that's, that's the file you got from the customer, and he says, I want this on black shirts. Well, the area around the artwork is called the canvas, and the canvas is white. Now, TCEPS doesn't know that this is canvas. TCEPS sees a graphic image, and it sees white as a color. And if you separate with TCEPS now with just this file, TCEPS will then make a white underbase, of course, for the entire design, but it's also going to give you white around the image. It is not that smart. I'm still amazed at people that think that maybe the program would know that this is the image and the area around it is not the image. This is called Canvas. To make a tra traditional underbase, we would actually convert this file to grayscale and invert it, meaning make a negative of it. If I make a negative of that, I'll do it right now, image mode, grayscale, and then we will do image adjustments, invert. That's like making a negative. Now, this center portion is an underbase. It's not a great underbase because there's not enough, not enough color under the black, under the red. This is the red airplane. I want to put more base below it. So a good underbase does a lot more than this, but this is a good underbase as a start. But the problem is there's, there's black around the image. If this is what my film looks like, and I have put this film and burn a screen, I'm going to be printing white ink around the image. So we don't want to do that. I'm going to go back in history, open the file up. If I had this as my file, and I wanted to make an underbase, image, mode, grayscale. Again, TCEPS does all this for you, and this is just a very basic underbase. If I now invert this, that's my... My, my film for the underbase, so there's, there's nothing around it. So this is what we have to, we call this masking, and masking is an old camera term where we would actually cut ruby lith masks around images. So somehow, some way, you need two versions of the art. And the reason is this, TCEPS uses the mask, or the black version, to create only the underbase and highlight. It doesn't pull the colors, it only makes, uses this, this version to make the underbase and highlight. If your design is only going on a white shirt, you don't need this image. You need just a white image. If you're designing only going on a black shirt and you don't plan to print black ink on that shirt, you're going to have shirt be the black, then you just need this image. And you're going to get this kind of artwork where sometimes it's a, that rock and roll, that metal look where it's a real freeform image on a black shirt. All you need is that version of the artwork. But if you need any design that has to have an underbase or for a pastel shirt or a black shirt and also needs black as a color because we can't pull black from this image, because we're going to be pulling black around it. If I want to pull black for the airplanes and for all the detail, I've got to work from the white image. If you're going to be working on images that work on light and dark shirts or pastel colored shirts, you need two versions of the art. Now, if this is all you got from the customer, making a black version is not that bad. If I click on Magic Wand and click, it selects around it. Now, this is a simple design, has a hard edge. If it had a soft edge, I may have to adjust what's called the tolerance setting in Magic Wand and the tolerance setting would be up here at the top. But if I now go to Edit, Fill, and fill my selection with black, there's my mask version. I'm going to do a Select, Deselect, take off the little marching ants, there's my black version. So somehow, some way, you have to make a black version of the artwork. Now, if you have a choice, ask the customer for a version that has a transparent background. If you have a choice, and you know they build it in AI, by the way, if they build it in AI or Corel, you know that when you bring it in, it's going to have a transparent background. Let's just go back to the file we looked at a second ago. Now, remember, Photoshop remembers the settings. That's the beauty. Photoshop remembers your settings from last time, but the default is 72 and anti-alias turned on. We want to turn that off. Again, I'm going to make this about 400 DPI just for this example. Say OK. 
and the file comes in with checks. That means that if I look at the layers panel, there's transparent background. Now, uh, old school way of doing the two versions is make a new layer, make a new layer, fill this layer with black, fill this layer with white, duplicate the file, and then flatten the image for the black layer. I'll just do right now, image, duplicate. I'm going to now flatten, because the file must be flattened and it must be RGB, flatten. There's my black version right there, done. Save it off as fight against breast cancer black or whatever we're going to call it. Go back to my original, turn off the black layer, flatten this image, discard the black layer, and voila, there we have the two versions of the art ready to go. Now, TSEPS is pretty smart now. Let's do this. We don't want to save that. Close this out. And yes, I'm going to get the running routines here in a second, but this is important because I can't tell you how many times people run routines and then they, they do all, these, all the tweaks or they do the JPEG enhancement. If you get a file like this, TSEPS has a button that does this. If I go to Simulated Process, click on that, get back to my simulated routine or my index routine, the button's still there. It's called Create Two Versions of the Artwork. The button is still there. If I get a file that has a transparent background and no additional layers, that's it, RGB, transparent background, click on the button. It tells you what it's going to do, and it does what I just did, only automatically. Boom, done, finished. There's the black version. There's the white version, and we save them off as black and white. If you look at my computer, you'll see that I have thousands of files called black and white. Don't let this bog you down. Watch the online video on this. There's a video on this that was shot in TSEPS 2.0. It's just you have to buy into it. The problem you're going to have sometimes is type, images that have a black type, and you're going to go on a black shirt. I get that all the time, and I haven't got probably a good sample here. But you get that where it's got black type, and... Uh, or in the case of this design, uh, it had a black outline around the lettering. Hard to see maybe on your monitor. But you have to decide what to do with that, with that black outline. And so sometimes people get confused because TSEPS doesn't know what to do with some of that stuff. So that's how we kind of get the artwork up to speed. And uh, there's certainly, you can spend a lot of time preparing the artwork. Frankly, running routines takes about 30 seconds for the main routines and then some tweaks. But if the artwork isn't done correctly, uh, you'll spend a lot of time cleaning things up. What will happen is you'll miss anti-aliasing is checked, you run a set of separations and now all your colors have halos around them because of the softened edges and you end up spending 20 minutes erasing those softened edges. Or you run a routine and find that the JPEG was so bad and it got worse and you wish you would have run the enhanced JPEG routine first. Now what routines do you run? TSEPS has routines for simulated process, index color, CMYK, spot color, and then kind of a fun routine which is monochrome, old photo, black and white routine. Again, I do separations all day long, and I typically, I say typically because now with these steps three, I do it a little differently, but I typically run the standard nine color routine. Now, I know if you're running only a six color press, this is more than you want to print, but typically the nine color routine gives you choices. What you need is choices. These steps will typically work off of a predetermined color palette, and you want choices. Now, I say I typically run the nine color. Uh, I've been doing that for years, but now with TSEPS 3, I've got a routine that runs uh, additional blues if my design has water, boats, fish, because I know, I know I'm going to have a turquoise in that water, but typically for most designs, I don't have much of a turquoise. I know if I'm going to do a design for like Harley or with flames, I want to run the flames routine. I know if I want to do a design with flesh tones, I want to run the flesh routine. In the older TSEPs, it was an optional routine, but now with TSEPs, uh, uh, 3.0, it gives you a lot more flesh choices. So now I would take a look and I might run these routines. But typically, I would run the nine color routine. I'm going to read dot TSEPs back here. So to run a program, you click on a button. I'm just going to run a nine color routine first to show you how simple it is. Click a button. It always prompts you. So if you're new to the program, you read the prompts. After a while, you blow by them. But in the beginning, you read them because they pretty much tell you what's going to happen here. It just says open the black or the masked file first and open the unmasked or the white file second. The file must be closed when you run a routine. 
again, I can't tell you uh, how many times people will say there's a problem, they're getting an error, and they say, I had the file open, and I ran a routine. Uh, in fact, it's funny, TCEP3 tells you at the very top header, it says the file must be closed before running of the separation routines. And so make sure the file's closed, and make sure the file is RGB with no additional layers hanging out there, no additional channels. Uh, I'll show you in a second what I mean, but it needs to be RGB and flattened. This has lots of colors going on. And the program just cooks. It's kind of fun to watch, and you can actually click on the channels panel while it's running. You can click, just do a little click, and it'll change your panel to the channels so you can actually see it cook. It just cooks. It's actually analyzing the art. It's determining the print sequence, adjusting for dot gain, doing all the gobbledygook, probably doing uh, about 500 mouse clicks. This is why I got tired of teaching this process because it was just too hard to teach. It's easier to just let, you, let TCEPs do the heavy lifting because the hard part is always fixing bad art and the hard part is always kind of doing a little tweaking afterwards to try and make the customer real happy. A design like this is probably somewhat forgiving. I think if we can name most of the key colors, we'll, the customer will be happy. There's no probably real Pantone matches. Maybe the guy that owns a motorcycle is going to insist that it's this maroon color. But as long as we come close on a design like this. Now, again, don't forget that, that Photoshop opened it as a, the tab as a document. So we're going to move it away. And typically what I will do is I will immediately save this file as SEPS. And then I will typically open up the white version and have it side by side. Now, I typically multi-monitor. I'm actually multi-monitoring for this workshop, but you can only see one of them. So typically, uh, I will put it right here so I can see it. And I will typically make my uh, panel a little narrower. So here's my separations. TCEPs always defaults to a black shirt. If I double-click, there's my shirt color. I'm going to change this by clicking. And then when I get color picker, just drive it off the edge. Dead white is 255 levels of RGB. Say OK. Now, TCEPs gives you optional underbases. I'm not going to worry about those for right now because I'm looking at a white shirt. Don't be put off by the fact that we're seeing black and I said it's a white shirt. In Photoshop, if you're looking at one channel by itself, it shows the channel in black and white. And the shirt color is in black because it's filled with rocks. It's hard to, to describe, but people go, why isn't it? It's filled. It's colored white but it's been filled with a solid fill so that when you show it with all the channels on, it shows as white because we painted it white, but it was filled. I like to just use the analogy. I filled it with rocks. I painted the rocks white. So when you put eyes on more than one channel, they display in color. Now I know, more colors than you want to print, but you see it kind of comes together. Not bad. Now, your choices are to now start reducing color count if you're on like a six-color press. Now, TCEPs has a five color routine that will reduce the color count. Uh, the problem with that routine is the green. It, does, it makes green out of blue and, and yellow, and green out of blue and yellow is not very good. This design, I think, needs green on its own. It's got quite a bit of green here, kind of a fluorescent green. I think it needs it by itself. And so now we're going to start remo removing colors. Let's see what happens if I reduce color, the color count. I'm going to take the gray, and I'm going to drop the gray down to the trash bin down below. Just delete it, delete it. There's the brown. I don't think I need the brown. A little bit of the uh, deal on the car. I uh, probably don't need the pink. Eh, maybe I need the pink. Look at the flags in the background. So you start, you start playing with it. Start tweaking. TCEPs gives you optional blacks. So it's going to give you a solid black. A solid meaning it has all the black images, image and also the black for shadows. But sometimes when you print a black like this, you're going to get the dark blacks looking good. But if you get them looking nice and dark, all the halftone blacks gain on you and they close up on you. So I give you an optional black that's just the halftones and I give you a black that's just the spot colors. If you have enough press head, you might want to print two blacks, one for the spot, one for the halftone black. If you have enough press heads, you print the one black. Let's change the shirt color to something other than white so we can look at the underbases. We'll just make it a uh, popular shirt color right now is uh, seem to be charcoal gray. Now, TCEPs gives you two different underbase choices. You're going to pick the one that's the best. One is higher contrast. That's the underbase. One is a little flatter. Sometimes the flatter one gives you a little more detail, though. I'm going to keep the flatter underbase. You can see I'm just dropping colors out. I'm going to click on the yellow, uh, click on the pink, the light blue, green, the scarlet red, the blue, the brown, the black. Now we do tweaks. I think it looks it's looking pretty good. Uh, I might click on the underbase channel. Where you're going to live is tone curve. If I go to image, 
adjustments curves. The shortcut is Control M on a PC and Command M on a Mac. Click on curves. Think of the curve as being this is the shadow dark areas of the underbase. I'm selected on the underbase channel, by the way, so that's where I'm working on. This is the lightest areas up at the upper right. This is called the midtone. I'm reducing the midtone. I'm boosting the midtone. Too much, too much, too much. You get the idea. Now, I think I probably need the pink. I take the pink off. See the difference in the flags in the background right in here? But can I afford pink? TSEPS has buttons that let you combine channels. I find them a little cumbersome, only if you're new to Photoshop, they're, they're real handy, and they, they make it all real automated for you, and it's called combined channels. But the truth is, uh, once you kind of get, as a power user with TSEPS, you realize that to combine the pink with the red, that's what I want to do, you select the red, and you go to Image, Apply Image. We're going to apply the pink to the red. We're going to tell it we want to apply the pink. And by the way, I had the pink turned off. By the way, look back here. You can see it. I had the pink turned off so I could see it. I just sent everything on the pink channel to the red channel. But I don't want to send it all because it's going to be red. I want to make it pink. I want to make it 50%. I'm going to say OK. And if you've taken any of my webinars or seminars in the past, you heard me say I got a color for free. I got pink for free. Do I need two blues? I probably do. That's the problem with the blue. The light baby blue can't be made from a tint of the darker blue. It just doesn't happen. You've got to pretty much always use the two blues. So that's a problem. Now a customer is forgiving and all you can print is five or six colors. You may have to decide which blue you want to keep. But that's the problem. Do I need the brown? That gives me a little detail in the car. On, off, on, off. I can almost always get brown for free by selecting the red channel and going to apply image and send the brown to the red, probably 60% and done. Got brown for free. All right. Uh, do I need the highlight? Well, it's kind of neat, but if I can't afford it, I'll dump it. Uh, I'm down to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If I need to actually uh, print this on a six-color press, I may have to actually uh, possibly combine the blues. Now, the black is a little weak. That's okay. The black is going to gain at press. I would rather have the black weaker than heavier. I could click on the black channel. Go to Image, Adjustments, Curves, pop that black a little bit, just a hair, make it look a little better. I feel warm and fuzzy about it, but I know it's going to get darker at press. I'd rather leave the black weak. TSEPS typically leaves the black a little weaker. Now, the red uh, motorcycle, kind of the maroon motorcycle, looks pretty good. The red looks good in the banner, but I know that I need more red on this. I told you you're going to live at, in, at the, uh, at the uh, tone curve. You're also going to live at Dodge Burn Tool right here. Little lollipop called the Dodge Tool. You want to have it always set for shadows. I say always loosely because sometimes you'll set it for midtones or for highlights, but set it for shadows. This is how much. You don't want it to be 100% because it's going to just be way over, overkill for you. And the tool has a tip to it. Hope you can see the tip on your screen. If I right mouse click, I can make the tip bigger. Those of you that drive Photoshop know that the, all the tools have a brush tip. I'm going to hold down the Alt key because I'm on a PC, which makes this now the burn tool. I'm going to burn in some red here. Ah, beautiful, beautiful, I like that. By the way, pick, I picked up some red in the car back here. I'm doing now just without the Alt key held down, I'm just doing the dodge. Dodge is lightning, burning is darkening. So you're going to take a little bit of time and do a little dodge burn, kind of play with it a little bit. This, this design looks pretty clean, a little dodge burn there, and I'm done. Finish, print this thing out. So now your choices are, by the way, let's close this file out, the uh, original. Let's save this. Now, if you are printing uh, to a RIP, like T-RIP, Photoshop CS6, if you're a, a normal user of the program, you know that there's no longer a screen button. You're going to have to actually convert the file to halftone dots. For do, doing that, you want to add registration marks. And I've given you uh, a lot of different options. These are obviously bigger than the Photoshop marks, other than the small quarter-inch marks are not, not much bigger than the Photoshop marks. This routine is all automated. You can now put targets in the centers, top, bottom, and sides. Centers only are the four corners. And basically, you need to give the file registration marks. Let's move the channels panel off here so we can see the channels. And we're just going to click. And it's going to cook. 
And now we have these honking targets. Now, some of you think those are too big, but the truth is those are they're not bad. They're, they're a little big for this design. These targets are based on the resolution of the file. This file may not have been 300 DPI. That's the problem. I use typically a little lower res files for demos because they run faster, especially if you're doing an online session. If, at 300 DPI, these targets would be, a little, would be smaller. It tells you at the bottom of the target window, these target sizes are based on the file being 300 DPI resolution. But now we have targets on all the, all the files. And now we can tell t to create halftone dots. We can convert this file to individual files, where each file is individual, and the actual channel header, which is this. And typically, I don't leave these the way they are. I want to have more information. I don't want to have it, say, under option under base low contrast. I will always click on the channel header, and I will typically now put in the mesh count. I would typically do the 230 mesh on this on a lighter dark shirt. I'll call this under base white. I will typically put flash after channel headers print on the films. And I think it's nice for production guys and the screen makers to see what's going on here. TSEPS doesn't do this because it doesn't know the print order because you deleted some channels and it doesn't know if you're in inches or centimeters. If you're in centimeters, a 90 mesh or a 230 mesh is a 90 mesh. If you're in centimeters, a 305 is a 120. I'll do all these, and that way when I print the individual channels out as halftones, this information is now the file name. So the file name has this information right here. That is the print order, mesh count, and the Pantone color. Now, people sometimes freak on the colors. They'll go, I can't find uh, lemon yellow from my, uh, my Wilflex color. I've given you the Pantone call out. Just try and come close to these colors. I mean, we're trying to use lemon yellow, scarlet red, uh, green as a typical, like a, like a, like a medium green and just try and come close to these colors if you can. Now, if I click on Convert Separation to Individual pre halftone Files, it'll make actually uh, seven separations here, there's seven, and it'll make them all halftone dots. That routine takes a while to run. It takes about three or four minutes to run. I'm not going to run it in this workshop. But what I want to do, really, is I want to convert the file to separations that are halftone and put back as channels. That way I can see what it's going to look like. Let me show you what I mean by that. This is one that I already did, and this routine to convert to file to to, to uh, half tones and then uh, put it back together again it takes about five minutes to run, which is why I'm not doing it in the, in the workshop. But if I now click on each channel for this design and zoom in, it's already half toned. Now the beauty of this routine, by the way, is I can actually preview it in color. I can see what it's going to look like on the shirt. And by the way, a routine that will let me merge all these channels together and make this one RGB file that you could then print out on an inkjet printer and show your customer as the real proof. You know, they get a little freaked out. You show them a nice high gloss proof and then you give them a shirt and it's got halftone dots. So this is a very cool routine. And by the way, now the file is already halftoned, ready to, to send to a printer. I could now print this to an inkjet printer. And if I have one of the newer printers like the Epson 1400 and 1430 that use dye-based ink and they print pretty dark, if I print at the highest photo setting to an inkjet printer without a rip, Rip is what kind of does the ink, ink, ink control and does halftones, but now I don't need it. I can print this to a regular ink chip printer at the highest photo setting, and I'm going to get a, a good-looking film. If I want to print to my RIP, I can. T-RIP or any of the RIPs you might have. A RIP does control ink deposit on any of the non-dye-based printers that use pigment ink. You may want to print to a RIP. So the file is now pre-halftoned. By the way, this routine lets you see mistakes. You'll see where maybe the color wasn't 100%, and that's a key thing. Let me close this file out. Now, I said that there's a, two areas so far you're going to live at. You're going to live at uh, a tone curve, you're going to live at dodge burn tool, and the last one is you're going to open up a panel called info. This is critical. I live at the info panel, and I'll tell you why. The info panel reads areas of density. If I click on the underbase by itself on this design, and I have the info panel open, and I have my eyedropper as my cursor, if I move the eyedropper around, see what it reads? This is a good example. It's reading 97%, 96%. I know that on this file, back in this area back here, I need solid underbase on a black shirt. If I make it 97%, it's going to be on the film uh, halftone. In fact, that's where that routine, the pre halftones of the files, you'll see areas that you think were 100%, you'll see they're halftone, and you wonder why. The info palette doesn't lie. 
and so, uh, info panel. They used to call these pallets. Now it's called panels. So you read the areas that you know should be 100%, and you read areas that are really faint, real weak, like that's 30, 41%. We know we could burn that on a screen. You'll see areas that are really, really light, like in front of this tire, that's 13%. Well, we, we could burn that. Uh, if you can't burn less than like a 7 or 8% dot, that's okay. You want to try and burn down to a 5% dot, but we're going to read that. So how do we fix it? If I go to Image, Adjustments, Curves, the info panel, by the way, is always live, meaning it now reads before and after. See it? I'm going to move the curve in just a little bit on the shadow area, and now I'm going to read the info panel. Close. 100%. That's what I want. I want to say OK. If I came in too far and I felt maybe I darkened the midtones, I'd bring this back a little bit. That's before, after, before, after. I'm going to say OK. And we're going to work through every separation. Now we know that in this case, this Todd Harding, that needs to be solid yellow. Let's just see if it is. And if you wonder why it's not, it's because T-SEPs may see a yellow that isn't quite what you wanted. That is 100% yellow. That's what I wanted. That's perfect. The light blue, most of the light blue is half tones. And by the way, see all this stuff here, these this shadows? This is because this file uh, had a lot of, uh, uh, it was saved at one time, not by me, with anti-aliasing turned on. And you can see the softening of the edges. And t -SEP sees that. And then what it does is, it puts that on the actual films. You're going to see that as a highlight, as a, as a halo. And you spend time erasing this stuff. This is where the anti-aliasing turned off is key. Otherwise, you're going to get this kind of stuff. And how do you fix this kind of stuff? Well, we'll do it quickly. You pick up the uh, lasso tool. And I just did just that, just to show you. And I just pressed the delete key on the keyboard. I filled it with white, and I deleted it. And when I do separations, uh, sometimes I kick and scream where I've got to spend a half hour fixing stuff like this. Let's check the green. Uh, the green's not bad. Let's check the red. We know that this banner should be red in it. I'm reading it with the info panel, and by the way, any of the tools you have open will read it. I'm on the, the zoom tool. Reads it right there. So the info panel is key. I leave it open. I leave it below the channels panel all the time. It's open all the time. I check every separation before I finalize it and make sure that areas that should be 100% are definitely 100%. So now we could actually say print and print this file out. And we know the mesh count, we know the print order, and it's a pretty clean deal. Now let's go back to index separation. I'm going to cover this quickly because I'm going to run out of time. I wanted to spend the most time on the simulated process because that's the routine you're going to run the most often. And again, if you have only a six-color press, you might run the five-color routine. Let me do this real quick. I'm going to run the five color on the same design. You'll see that it actually works. It's the green will suffer. But then again, if the customer is forgiving and uh, all he's paid you for is six colors, then it may be okay. Let it cook. It'll well on the blues and the reds. It's going to give you still the 200 base choices. So you can see the key to the program uh, is to get the artwork correct before you run the routines. Do the best you can to fix the artwork. It's hard to fix it after the fact. Then the key is to, after you've done separations, don't be shy about info panel. Don't be shy about doing little tweaks, lightening areas, darkening areas. Be bold. I will sometimes get sample separations in from customers that will say, I ran your program and it did, did OK, but I think it could have done better. Uh, what do you think? And I'll come back and I'll go, what tweaks did you do? And they'll go back, I didn't do any. And I'll come back and say, well, watch this. I boosted the underbase a little bit, and it looks great. And they'll go, wow, I didn't know I could do that. Well, if you read the manual, it's all about doing the final tweaks. All right, so let's take a look at this now real quick. Undock this. See what we have on a black shirt. There's the underbase. There's the yellow. Light blue, red, blue, black. See the green? The green is not bad, but it's kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a dirty green, kind of a lime green when you mix yellow and blue. But it still works. And so this design now can be a one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I said seven colors. We don't print black on a black shirt. And on a light shirt, we don't print an underbase. This can actually be a six-color print on a light or a dark shirt. You're going to burn seven screens, and you're going to swap those two screens out, depending on if it's a light or a dark shirt. And the same tweak supply, click on the red, you know, click on the, uh, the, the motorcycle, the Dodge Burn tool, click on the underbase and pop it a little bit. 
Okay, I'm going to quickly cover a couple more routines. Uh, I'll do a second webinar next week on the uh, the other programs I haven't covered in this because there's just not enough time to cover them all. But index color works well for some designs. I would say that about a third of the jobs I get in, the customer has said, make it index color or what you think is best, Scott. I run index probably one out of 40 designs. It's just, it's a nice routine. Indexing makes the entire design out of pixels. But the problem is a lot of your screen burners will have a hard time burning the screens. They'll freak when they see them. And so I typically run indexing only as a last resort sometimes. Sometimes indexing does a really nice job. Indexing lets you pick the color from the design. And when you run the routine, it pretty much says what colors are in the design, and you pick those colors. And so it actually separates based on the colors in your design. That's really cool. And I'm just showing it to here because this is a routine that I rarely run, and I don't have time to cover it in this webinar. But I just wanted to show you that indexing can be very cool. Here's the deal. Some of you will send me files and say, what routine would you run? And my response is always very friendly in what routine did you run? because it takes 30 seconds. And I want you to be bold and brave and not be shy. Click a button, run a routine, see what happens. TCEPs displays on the monitor very accurate. So if you have a routine and maybe you think it isn't quite right, tweak it, boost it. With indexing, you can't do much but boost the underbase. But in this design, I think it looks pretty good, although I think it's a little dark in this, this wave. I would go to Image, Adjustments, Curves, and I would boost the underbase. Don't be shy. Besides my common response of, did you use the Zoom tool, my common response is, is, be bold and brave, and don't be afraid to make tweaks. Typically, by boosting the inner base, it's all it needs for a dark shirt is sometimes the base is, is just uh, needs to be popped a little bit. That is uh, uh, the basic program. Now, I want you to be bold and kind of work through all these other menus. There's lots going on here. If you need additional training and support, if you click on the support button down below at the bottom, it actually links you to the most current online support page. I'm updating this page uh, right now to include more support for TCEPS 3. Uh, this computer is online, but it's kind of sluggish to bring it up. But it takes you actually online. You're still in Photoshop, by the way. You never leave Photoshop. It takes you to the most current support page. The user's manual is also available here, but it's actually easier if you print it out. I think you need to bring up the PDF and print it out. This page takes you to the most current online training videos. And so if you need additional help or support, this page, the training videos, there's over 25 videos. Now, most of them online right now were done in TCEPS 2.0. But as far as the tweaks and fixing the artwork and all that, that's all the same. That hasn't changed. It's just the basic running the routines a little different in TCEPS 3.0. But there's over 25 videos. And if you're new to Photoshop, you really want to watch the Photoshop videos. Those are excellent. It's pretty much me teaching you how to use Photoshop and it covers all the key points. And this is all done right directly from within the program. That's all I've got. You can email me direct to scott at tbiznetwork.com. I answer questions all the time. That's all I've got for today. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. I'm going to be doing more webinars with more in-depth. I'm doing a webinar on Friday on the uh, doing more aggressive tweaks to programs. I, I hope to see you there. Thanks a lot. Enjoy talking with you guys. Bye-bye.